e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā karangatanga maha no ngā hoe whā. Kei oku rangatira e oku hoa mahi, koutou katoa ki a roi, kua roi ka mai nei i tēnei wā, tēnā koutou a tēnā tātou katoa. Ko teritiri o te moana te maunga e whakamaru nei aho, ko waimakiriri te awa e mahia nei aku mā harahara. Nō te raki o airangi me kōtirana o kūtipuna, e mihi ana ki ngā tohu o nehe o te whanganui a tara e noho nei au. Kō varima pō ahau. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Good morning and welcome to this briefing on our draft decisions for TransPower's individual price quality path, reset, and the reset of the default price quality path for electricity distribution businesses for the next regulatory period. My name is Vari Mopor, I'm a commissioner, and I lead part four division, which is responsible for regulation of, of energy networks at the commission. I'm joined this morning by senior members of our team for both TransPower and electricity distribution businesses. They will be available at the end of this briefing to help answer any questions you may have. James Mulrennan is with me and will moderate any questions we receive. I would like to note that this briefing is being recorded and will be published on our website in the next few days. Our draft determinations and reasons papers have been published on the website this morning. I'm going to begin today's briefing with a short overview of our regulatory role in the electricity sector. I'll then run through the draft decisions at a high level before talking through some of the external drivers that have influenced our decisions. After that, I'll take you through some of the details of our draft decisions, first for TransPower and then for local lines companies. I may sometimes refer to local lines companies as EDBs, they are the same thing. Then I'll provide an overview of our draft what our draft decisions mean for consumers and the steps we have taken to lessen the immediate impact on consumers' pockets. The briefing will wrap up with a reminder about what happens between now and the publication of our final decisions. I've tried to make this presentation as straightforward to understand as possible. However, there will be opportunity for your questions at the end of the briefing. Please put your questions into the Q&A function as we go along or at the end. James will put these to me and the team after I've finished speaking. If we're not able to get to all your questions this morning, we will follow up directly with you. So as I said, I'll begin the briefing by providing a, a brief overview of our regulatory role in electricity. Part four of the Commerce Act requires us to reset the price quality paths for national grid owner TransPower and 16 local lines companies by the 30th of November 2024. This includes setting the maximum revenue TransPower and the non-exempt local lines businesses can each earn and the minimum quality standards they must meet. The purpose of this regulation is that businesses are incentivised to invest, innovate, find cost savings and meet consumer demands. At the end of the day, it's about ensuring Kiwis continue to receive a safe and reliable supply of electricity now and into the future. TransPower is subject to an individual price quality path, which requires it to provide us with a, a detailed expenditure plan for the next five years. TransPower consults with its customers and stakeholders and has the plan reviewed by an independent expert before we assess it. 13 local lines companies are exempt from price quality regulation and subject to information disclosure regulation only. Those 16 that are not exempt are subject to the default price quality path and also have an option to apply for a customised price quality path. Circumstances have changed significantly since we last set revenue allowances in 2019. Costs have escalated across the economy and interest rates have risen. At the same time, the sector is facing a step change in spending requirements, driven by the need to renew networks that were 
built last century, many in the 1960s and 70s, as well as changing resilience needs, population growth and increased electrification. Elsewhere, innovative and non-network solutions are a growing opportunity for lines companies to enhance network capacity efficiently. We're very mindful that price increases will be unwelcome as consumers face higher costs across their budgets. However, we also know the importance of allowing businesses to recover their reasonable costs in order to maintain incentives to invest. Delaying investment could lead to less resilient and reliable networks and a network that is not able to keep up with demand growth as well as higher prices down the track. Our draft decision to increase revenue allowances for both TransPower and local lines companies reflects higher costs and interest rates and the investment needs of the country's electricity networks. For TransPower, our draft decision is to increase revenue by 15% in each of 2025 and 2026 and by 5% in each of the remaining three years of the regulatory period to 2030. For local lines businesses, our draft decision is to increase maximum revenue by 24% on average in 2025, followed by lower business-specific annual increases out to 2030. Because revenue increases are funded by the consumers who benefit from the network, this will mean an increase in the prices most consumers see in their electricity bills. Today's draft decisions represent approximately an extra $15 on the average household's monthly bill with variances across different regions and types of consumers. This increase is for 2025 with increases of about $5 per month in each subsequent year. Our draft decision smooths this increase. This means that the initial price increase is lower than it would otherwise have been, although this results in slightly higher increases in later years. Without the Commission's proposal to slow revenue recovery, consumers could be looking at price increases of around $25 per month in 2025. The proposed increase reflects the higher costs companies are facing, including the cost of borrowing, cost of materials, and inflationary pressures since the last review period. At the start of each regulatory period, we set the allowed return on capital or weighted average cost of capital. The increase in interest rates since 2019 is a significant reason for the higher cost of running capital intensive businesses like lines companies. In the 2020 to 25 regulatory period, the WAC is 4.6%. Our current estimate is that the relevant cost of capital for 2025 to 2030 is 7.4%. We will determine an up-to-date value before our final decision. The proposed revenue increase also recognises that ageing assets require replacement or greater maintenance, and networks will need to grow and adapt to meet new demands from the increasing electrification of transport and industrial process heat, as well as connecting new generation, including locally. Businesses must also reconsider resilience needs in response to climate change. About one third of the increase in revenue relates to greater expenditure allowances. Meanwhile, international competition for skilled workers and equipment remains strong, continuing to place upward pressure on, on costs. I'm now going to take you through our draft decisions for TransPower in a little more detail. TransPower is proposing a substantial work program to replace and renew assets that were built in the middle of last century. 
the work proposed by TransPower will enable it to maintain a safe and reliable supply as New Zealand becomes more reliant on electricity. We are satisfied that TransPower's proposal is largely justified and underpinned by a mature asset management approach. TransPower has made significant progress in its management of network assets. While we are satisfied that TransPower's proposed work program is generally prudent, we are concerned that TransPower may not actually be able to recruit the workforce necessary to deliver its forecast work program. TransPower's most recent update to us indicated it is currently tracking behind its recruitment target for this year. For this reason, we have made some of TransPower's expenditure allowance contingent on it meeting specified recruitment targets. On the quality side, we're leaving the package of grid output measures unchanged to ensure that the current quality of service is maintained. Our draft decision is to also introduce annual delivery reporting requirements given the increase in TransPower's workload. Having considered TransPower's CapEx proposal, our draft decision is to approve $2.1 billion in real terms, which is 98% of TransPower's proposed base CapEx. This is a 26% increase from the previous period. While it is a significant increase on TransPower's RCP3 spend, we consider it necessary to ensure that TransPower is replacing end-of-life assets in a timely manner and maintaining a safe and reliable network. We have approved $132 million of resilience expenditure. TransPower proposed a $199 million resilience package using base capex and a use it or lose it fund for it to access at its discretion. Our draft decision is not to approve this mechanism or all the funding. However, there is a reopener available for TransPower to seek additional resilience funding when it has more certainty about the timing and costs of the remaining projects. As I noted earlier, we have some concerns around the availability of the skilled workforce needed to de deliver an expanded work program. Specialist skill sets are in high demand both here and overseas, and recruitment of specialist staff may create challenges for TransPower to deliver its work program. As a result, we have reduced TransPower's CapEx allowance by $111 million. However, we are making this funding available through a streamlined reopener subject to TransPower providing information on its recruitment progress. <clears throat> Moving on to operating expenditure, our draft decision is to approve $1.9 billion in real terms, which is 96% of TransPower's proposed OPEX. This is a 15% increase from the previous period. TransPower's OPEX forecasts have been developed using a base step and trend methodology, which we consider to be a reasonable approach. Increases in OPEX are being driven by the increased workforce required to support its CapEx program. We consider this expenditure is reasonable. However, similar to CapEx, we have made a deliverability adjustment with a mechanism available for TransPower to access the additional allowance subject to it providing information on its recruitment progress. Increasing grid maintenance is another important driver of OPEX. While TransPower is increasingly replacing its aging asset base, we consider there is also a justified need for higher maintenance expenditure as TransPower maintains assets that are not yet due for replacement. Increases in WAC and inflation, along with the wash-up of RCP3 revenue and our expenditure decisions, result in a total revenue allowance of $5.8 billion over RCP4. This is a 43% increase on TransPower's RCP3 revenue. We are mindful of the impact this increase may have on consumers. Rather than a single year step change to the new revenue requirements, as was proposed by TransPower, our draft decision is to increase TransPower's revenue 
over the first two years of RCP4 before moving to a flatter profile over the final three years. In numbers, this is a nominal increase of 15% in each of the first two years of RCP3 and a 5% annual increase for the final three years. Our last slide for Transpower looks at quality standards and input methodology or IM amendments. For Transpower's quality obligations, we are proposing to retain the package of grid output measures but have updated the metrics to reflect improving performance and where relevant have taken into account Transpower's work program. Alongside the price path draft determination, we're issuing some proposed targeted input methodology amendments to give effect to the reset. These IM changes include the implementation of indexation of the asset base or RAB, the deliverability reopener, and the impact of reopeners on quality standards and a one-off adjustment to the EV account. I will now move on to our draft decision for local lines companies. Like Transpower and other New Zealand businesses, New Zealand's local lines companies are experiencing higher costs due to recent inflation and interest rate rises. An uplift in revenue over the coming regulatory period is required to meet these costs and to enable investment to maintain reliability and support growth. Businesses have forecast more investment than our draft decision allows. In our view, there is significant uncertainty about some of the forecast growth, and similar to Transpower, we have concerns about the deliverability of some of the forecast increase due to the implied increase needed in the workforce. Recent changes to the regulatory framework have increased flexibility and where businesses are able to justify specific projects later, they can apply for a reopener to increase allowed revenue. A customised price path, or CPP, remains available where a business has specific significant growth or other investment needs, and these are supported by their customers. Our draft decisions provide for some specific increases in operating costs identified for EDBs, such as insurance premium increases and low voltage network monitoring costs. Low voltage monitoring in particular will be critical to enable innovative solutions to demand growth, including load shifting. To further support the development of alternative investment and operating practices, we have included a detailed outline of the new broader innovation allowance in our draft decision. We intend to run a separate technical workshop on this aspect of the draft decision to ensure this allowance will achieve the benefits that we believe are available for consumers. We have proposed that the allowance is worth up to 0.6% of revenue for each business over the regulatory period. Finally, our draft decision includes revenue smoothing. This limits the initial price increase for consumers and spread some of the effect of higher inflation and interest rates across the rest of the regulatory period. For CapEx, we have set allowances below the level of investment forecast by Lions companies, reflecting our assessment of what is appropriate in the current environment. At an aggregate level, our decision is to allow $5.6 billion in capital expenditure in real terms. This is 35% higher than, in, than the DPP3 allowance. Our decision on the CapEx allowance reflect that a higher allowance is appropriate to recognise local lines businesses are facing cost increases and that greater investment is required to maintain reliability and meet consumer demand. However, we have concerns about the practical deliverability of such a large forecast step change in investment, and our view is that there is significant uncertainty around the timing, scale, and location of some forecast demand increases. 
Our regulatory framework enables local lines businesses to apply for additional allowances during the regulatory period where better information becomes available about specific projects or new events occur. Looking at OPEX now, we have set allowances that reflect the increase in operating costs faced by the sector during the last regulatory period. We have also proposed new step changes in OPEX to respond to business specific conditions. Our draft decision is to allow an increase in aggregate OPEX to $3.5 billion in real terms. This is 19% higher than the DPP3 allowance. We set OPEX allowances using a base, step and trend approach. We have made a number of changes to our financial forecasting models since the previous reset to better reflect the likely operating expenditure needs and cost inflation pressures affecting local lines businesses. Our draft decision also includes five step changes. These are an increase for insurance to reflect significant forecast increases in insurance premiums, an increase to enable access to low voltage data and associated costs for monitoring and analysis. This will ensure local lines businesses have the appropriate information to enable flexible and innovative solutions to growing demand and reliability needs a change for new cybersecurity costs and software as a service, as many lines businesses have signalled a transition towards cloud-based IT solutions. And finally, targeted allowances for new consumer engagement initiatives. This slide provides information about the revenue smoothing that we have proposed in our draft decision. The left-hand chart illustrates that in 2025-26, the second column, we have deferred revenue recovery. This is the tan-coloured segment. This revenue is recovered towards the end of the regulatory period. The right-hand chart illustrates the effect of smoothing in different regions. The red bars show the smoothed increase in revenue for 2025 for each EDB, compared to the unsmoothed blue bars. Among the objectives of our decisions is ensuring that suppliers have incentives to innovate, as well as to deliver services at the quality consumers want. For innovation incentives, our key draft decisions are firstly to maintain equal penalties and rewards for CapEx and OPEX savings in the incentive scheme called IRIS. This scheme ensures that EDBs have the right financial incentive to choose the most efficient solution, whether that involves a capital investment or operating costs. And secondly, to introduce an innovation and non-traditional solutions allowance. Local lines businesses will be able to apply for this allowance, which in our draft decision is capped at 0.6% of their maximum allowed revenue over the DPP4 period. While local lines businesses already have the flexibility to prioritise spending on innovative projects, this allowance would provide an additional incentive to encourage lines businesses to try out new things, either on their own or collaboratively, that are likely to benefit their consumers. Moving to quality, our draft decision is to retain the quality standards and incentive scheme that has been applied in DPP3. Quality standards are an important part of a price quality path and are intended to ensure that any cost savings sought by local lines businesses do not come at the expense of quality of service. The draft decision is to retain the same quality standards based on duration and frequency of system interruptions called SADI and SAFI, with minor refinements to the previous approach to better reflect the current context. So what does all this mean for Kiwi households? If we don't provide incentives for Transpower and local lines companies to continue to maintain their assets and invest appropriately, New Zealanders are more likely to face poorer quality services and ultimately higher costs in the future. The Commission does not fix the price that consumers are charged, 
but the revenue allowances that we set will obviously impact final electricity prices and bills. The transmission and distribution components of the average consumer bill are 10.5% and 27% respectively. From the 1st of April 2025, those transmission and distribution components of electricity bills will increase. We have estimated that on average, the distribution and transmission component of an electricity bill will increase by $15 per month. This represents an additional $180 per year on average across regulated networks. From a regional perspective, the average increase varies between about $10 and $20 per month. There are various reasons for the differences between lines companies, but a significant factor is the number of consumers that costs are spread over. That brings me to the end of the presentation. To summarise, we're proposing to increase the maximum allowable revenues for both Transpower and local lines businesses. This draft decision is because of higher interest rates, an increase in expenditure, and the inflationary effect of higher input costs for workforce and equipment. Our role is to protect consumers' interest in having a safe and reliable network that provides value for money. In our draft decision, we have not allowed the full amount of expenditure that is forecast by Transpower and local lines companies. We have concerns about whether the industry can attract sufficient skilled workers to deliver such a large increase in investment. We also consider that there is uncertainty about some elements of the forecasts, including need, cost and timing. We have introduced the Innovation and Non-Traditional Solutions Allowance for EDBs to create stronger incentives for innovative, cheaper solutions that will benefit consumers in the long term. Finally, we have smoothed revenue increases across the regulatory period for Transpower and the EDBs to reduce the initial price impact on consumers. We've come to the end of the presentation, which I hope has given you a useful overview of our draft decisions. Stakeholders now have an opportunity through our submission and cross-submission processes to express their views which we will consider ahead of our final decisions in November. The relevant dates are on this slide. Please note that Transpower has a shorter consultation period. Stakeholders will be aware they've already had input to Transpower's proposal. Further information is available on our website. Now we'll turn to your questions. If you haven't submitted your question yet, please feel free to do so using the Q&A function.